All right, I think we can get started. Uh, so nice to see everyone today. Thanks for joining us on this lovely Sunday to talk a little bit more about Grant Wood's Impressionism. Can everyone hear me? Wonderful. All right, so let me pull up just a second. Share my screen here. All right, so this is gonna be slightly different. Um, I have this as a PDF as opposed to um, a PowerPoint as it is a fairly large one. So just one second. Oop. There we go. All right. So American regionalist painter Grant Wood only arrived at his signature style as we see here, um, around 1930. In the remaining 12 years before his untimely death in 1942, Wood produced several seminal works, of course, many seen here, Woman with Plants, John B. Turner Pioneer, Young Corn. Uh, although his total output was limited due to his teaching at the University of Iowa uh, and his role as the public director of the Public Works of Art Project in Iowa. Before 1930, Wood was much more prolific and the style he utilized was Impressionism, as we see here. Um, this was a stylistic movement begun in France in the 1860s, which swept across Europe and eventually came to the United States. American Impressionism was the prevailing style in the U.S. from the late 1880s into the 1920s. Characterized by, as many of you may know, loose brushwork, vivid colors, and an interest in the effects of light, American Impressionism was greatly influential to the young Grant Wood. He even painted in the same locales time and time again at different times of day during different times of year and under different weather conditions, which we will look at um, in a moment. And this is just what the French Impressionists used to do. Uh, so the Cedar Rapids Museum of Art is the holder of the world's largest collection of works by Wood. And so we are uniquely positioned to tell the story of this early phase of Wood's career. Um, so this talk traces the trajectory of Wood's interest in Impressionism from the 1910s an early piece seen here on the left, uh, to the dramatic style changes that we saw in the late 1920s, which were largely the result of a trip to Germany to oversee the fabrication of the stained glass window in the Vets Memorial Building, um, seen here on the right. Um, but what I was interested in primarily as an art historian when I started looking at this topic um, is kind of to discuss how we got here, how Grant Wood came to be painting in the Impressionist style in the teens and 20s, um, and kind of position that in the greater narrative of art history. So to do this, we have to go back a ways. So in 1874, a group of artists called the Anonymous Society of Painters, Sculptors, Printmakers, et cetera, organized an exhibition in Paris that officially launched the movement called Impressionism. Uh, its founding members included Claude Monet, Edgar Degas, and Camille Pizarro, all of whose works we see here, uh, among others. Uh, this group was really unified only by its independence from the official artistic salon, uh, for which a jury of artists from the Academy des Beaux-Arts selected artworks and awarded medals. Uh, this group of independent artists, despite their diverse approaches to painting, which we can see here, um, appeared to contemporaries as a group. And while conservative critics panned their work for what they considered to be its unfinished, sketch-like appearance, more progressive writers praised it for its depiction of modern life. Edmond Ranty, for example, in his 1876 essay, The New Painting, wrote of their depiction of contemporary subject matter in a suitably innovative style as a revolution in painting. The exhibiting collective avoided choosing a title that would imply a unified movement or school, although some of them subsequently adopted the name by which they would eventually be known, the Impressionists. Uh, today, their work is recognized for its modernity, embodied in its rejection of established styles, its incorporation of new technology and ideas, and its depiction of modern life. The word impressionism comes from Claude Monet's Impression Sunrise, which was exhibited in 1874. Um, and this came when the critic Louis Leroy accused of being a sketch or impression as opposed to a finished painting. Uh, so it demonstrates many of the techniques that the in, these independent artists adopted. You can see here short broken brush strokes that just barely convey forms uh, there's pure unblended colors and an emphasis on the effects of light, certainly seen here in the reflection of the sun in the water. 
rather than the neutral whites, grays, and blacks, impressionists often rendered shadows and highlights in color. The artist's loose brushwork gives an effect of spontaneity and effortlessness that masks their carefully constructed compositions, such as Alfred Sisley's Allée of Chestnut Trees here on the left. And the seemingly casual style became widely accepted even in the official salon as the new language with which to depict modern life. Uh, so in addition to their radical technique, the bright colors of the Impressionist canvases were shocking for eyes that were accustomed to the more sober colors seen in academic painting. Many of the independent artists chose not to apply the thick golden varnish that painters customarily use to tone down their works. Uh, the paints themselves were more vivid as well. The 19th century saw the development of synthetic pigments for artist paints, providing vibrant shades of blue, green, and yellow that painters had never used before. Edouard Manet's 1874 boating, seen here on the right, for example, features an expanse of the new cerulean blue and synthetic ultramarine. Depicted in a radically cropped Japanese-inspired composition, the fashionable boater and his companion embody modernity in their form, their subject matter, and the very materials used to paint them. Such images of suburban and rural leisure outside of Paris were a very popular subject for the Impressionists, uh, notably Monet and Auguste Renoir. Several of them lived in the country for part or all of the year. New railway lines radiating, depicted here in Monet, the Garçon Lazare, uh, radiated out from the city and made travel so convenient that Parisians virtually flooded into the countryside every weekend. Uh, while some of the Impressionists, such as Pizarro, focused on the daily life of local villagers in Pontras, most preferred to depict the vacationers' rural pastimes. Uh, the boating and bathing establishments that flourished in these regions became favorite motifs. And in his 1869 La Grenolie, for example, Monet's characteristically loose painting style complements the leisure activities he portrays. Landscapes, which figure prominently in Impressionist art, were also brought up to date with innovative compositions, light effects, and use of color. Monet, in particular, emphasized the modernization of the landscape by including railways and factories, signs of encroaching industrialization that would have seemed inappropriate to the Barbizon artists of the previous generation. But perhaps the prime site of modernity in the late 19th century was the city of Paris itself, renovated between 1853 and 1870 under Emperor Napoleon III. His prefect, Baron Ausmann, laid the plans, tearing down old buildings to create more open space for a cleaner, safer city. Um, if you have traveled to Paris within your lifetime, you are experiencing Baron Ausmann's Paris. Also contributing to this new look was the Siege of Paris during the Franco-Prussian War of 1870 through 71, which required reconstructing parts of the city that had been destroyed. Impressionists such as Pizarro and Gustave Caibal, whose Pont le Europe we're seeing right here, enthusiastically painted the renovated city, employing their new style to depict its wide boulevards, public gardens, and grand buildings. While some focused on the cityscapes, others turned their sights to the city's inhabitants. The Paris population exploded after the Franco-Prussian War, uh, which gave artists a tremendous amount of material for their scenes of urban life. Characteristic of these scenes was the mixing of social classes that took place in public settings. Both Degas and Caibo focused on working people, including singers and dancers, as well as workmen. Others, including Berta Morisot and Mary Cassatt, depicted the privileged classes. The Impressionists also painted new forms of leisure, uh, including theatrical entertainment, such as Cassatt's 1878 in the Loge, seen here on the left, cafes, popular concerts, and dances. Taking an approach similar to naturalist writers such as Emile Zola, the painters of urban scenes depicted fleeting yet typical moments in the lives of characters they observed, much like Caibo's 1877 Paris Street Rainy Day seen here on the right. These exemplify how these artists abandoned sentimental depictions and explicit narratives, adopting a detached objective view that merely suggests what's going on. The independent collective of Impressionists had a fluid membership over the course of the eight exhibitions it organized between 1874 and 1886, with the number of participating artists ranging anywhere from nine to 30. Pizarro, whose Peasant's House Irani from 1887 we see here, the eldest, was the only artist who participated in all eight shows, while Berta Morisot, 
the work in the middle called The Cradle from 1872, participated in seven. Ideas for an independent exhibition had been discussed as early as 1867, but the Franco-Prussian War intervened. The painter Frederick Basile, who's Women in the Garden from 1866 we see on the right, had been leading the efforts and was killed in the war, which set them back a bit. Subsequent exhibitions were headed by different artists. There were philosophical and political differences amongst the Impressionists that led to heated disputes and fractures within the group, causing fluctuations in the contributors to the exhibition. The, ex the exhibitions even included the works of more conservative artists who simply refused to submit their work to the Salon jury. Also participating in the independent exhibitions were Paul Cezanne. And here we see his view of Auvers from 1874 on the left and Paul Gauguin, Breton Women at the Turn from 1888 on the right, uh, whose styles would later grow out of their early work with the Impressionists. Uh, and these are two really stunning examples of the early work of Cezanne and, and Gauguin, two of my favorite pieces. The last of the independent exhibitions in 1886 also saw the beginning of a new phase in avant-garde painting. By this time, few of the participants were working in recognizably Impressionist manner. Most of the core members were developing new individual styles that caused ruptures in the group's tenuous unity. Pizarro had promoted the work of Georges Seurat. This is his Le Bec du Coq Grand Camp from 1885 on the left, um, and Paul Signac's Gulf Juan from 1896 in the middle. Uh, in addition to adopting their new technique based on points of pure color known as Neo-Impressionism, the young Gauguin was also making his forays into primitivism, and the nascent symbolist, Odillon Redon, who's Cyclops from 1898, sometime between there and 1914, we see on the right, uh, also contributed, although Redon's style was unlike any other participants. Because of the group's stylistic and philosophical fragmentation, and because of the need for assured income, some of the core members, such as Monet and Renoir, exhibited in venues where their works were more likely to sell. Its many facets and varied participants make the Impressionist movement difficult to define. Indeed, its life was as fleeting as the light effects that it sought to capture. Even so, an impression, Impressionism was a movement of enduring consequence as its embrace of modernity made it a springboard for later avant-garde art in Europe. And so, bringing it back to our immediate topic, Impressionism was also hugely influential to American art and in America generally. So after the end of the Civil War in 1865, the United States gained unprecedented international, political, and economic status. American art patrons, we're looking particularly at the Vanderbilts here, this is the Breakers. Uh, American art patrons, notably Northerners who had made their fortunes from the war, traveled abroad and imbibed European culture. To announce their wealth and sophistication, they built grand houses and filled them with imported decorative arts and paintings, both by old masters and contemporary academics. To appeal to prospective patrons, aspiring American artists felt the need to study in Europe, particularly in Paris, to truly complete their artistic education. Um, and I will, of course, remind everyone that Grant Wood went to Europe four times during the 1920s, as he still very much viewed that as an important finishing part of an artist's education. Soon after Americans began to earnestly collect and emulate European art, the French Impressionists made their debut at a private exhibition in Paris in, 19, in 1874, as we discussed. They would show together eight times in all until 1886. Young American artists in Paris in the 1870s who were studying with academic teachers virtually ignored Impressionism and the few artists who took note of the radical style were appalled. Uh, one of my favorites, J. Alden Weir, is depicted here. Uh, he visited the third group exhibition in the spring of 1877 and wrote to his parents, I never in my life saw more horrible things. They do not observe drawing nor form, but give you an impression of what they call nature. It was worse than the chamber of horrors, end quote. Um, and this is J. Alden Weir's self-portrait, as we see on the left. Uh, there were exceptions to the American disdain of Impressionism during its early years, of course. Pittsburgh-born Mary Cassatt uh, moved to Paris in 1874 and was very sympathetic to the Impressionists. Her work attracted the attention of Edgar Degas, who in 1877 invited her to exhibit with the group and became an important part of her artistic life. 
And on the left, we have Degas' painting of Mary Cassatt at the Louvre from 1880. And on the right, Cassatt's Young Mother Sewing from 1900. Another exception to this initial American dislike of the Impressionist style was John Singer Sargent, seen here in a self-portrait on the left. Uh, Sargent was born in Florence, Italy to expatriate American parents and by 1874 was studying in Paris where he met Claude Monet two years later and was inspired by him and his colleagues to paint lively urban scenes. Unlike Assad, Sargent was not a fully fledged Impressionist, but he had an important impact on the development of the movement as a conduit of new ideas from Paris to his friends and colleagues in the States. His own style mixed elements of Impressionism with more traditional academic smoothness, uh, which is understandable because Sargent's main bread and butter as an artist was portraiture. And if you are commissioning a portrait, you generally want it to look pretty much like the person you have commissioned it of. Um, this is Sargent's Mrs. Fisk Warren and her daughter Rachel from 1903 on the right. So you can see he still does have a fairly loose brushwork, even though he's doing portraiture, but it's not as loose as Impressionists would do. And he tightens it up in the face, certainly. During the mid 1880s, as French Impressionism lost its radical edge, American collectors began to value the style and more American artists began to experiment with it after absorbing academic fundamentals. So the progression still was that you learn your drawing and you go to an academic institution, you go to the Académie Julienne, you go to the Académie des Beaux-Arts, and you learn the academic way to do something, and then you can start to experiment with Impressionism and loosen things up. Impressionism in American art built upon the examples of landscape painting being practiced by earlier Hudson River School painters as we see here on the left, and the tonalists, particularly in their emphasis on immersion in the natural world and an attention to light and color. Uh, so on the left, we see Thomas Cole's view of the Catskills early autumn from 1836-37, and George Innes's Spring Blossoms Montclair on the right. Uh, so this was the tradition of landscape painting as it existed in America in the mid to late 19th century. The Hudson River School uh, which was known for its verisimilitude and its attention to realism and natural detail. And the tonalists, which were, as we can see here, uh, looser, brushier, and very, very involved in the overlapping influences of light and atmosphere, but not quite the same as Impressionism. Um, American landscape painting is markedly different from European in its scale. Um, the Impressionist interest in everyday life, modernity, and commonplace scenes is really different from these transcendentalist visions of early 19th century American landscape painting, which emphasize the great wilderness and sublimity of nature that we see out west. So this is Albert Bierstadt's Mount Corcoran from 1876 through 77. So at the same time, the first Impressionism exhibition is happening in Paris. This is what is really the pinnacle of American landscape painting. So again, this great verisimilitude, attention to detail um, and sense of the sublime. You are supposed to be awed by these paintings. Um, they were supposed to really subject you to kind of the terror and the beauty of nature all at once. So the Impressionists, um, usually much smaller scale, a little bit more intimate scenes were very different from what was happening in America. But exhibitions of Impressionist works were held in American cities and sales were strong. In 1886, with a series of brilliant images of New York's public parks, William Merritt Chase became the first major American painter to create Impressionist canvases in the United States. One of these works is Mrs. Chase in Prospect Park from 1886. This is his wife out boating in Prospect Park. And William Merritt Chase always has very large signatures on his paintings, so you can see his right there. So at about the same time Impressionism was becoming more popular, Americans began to visit artist colonies that centered on outdoor painting, uh, most notably Giverny, seen here in this photo with Monet. Um, this is where Monet settled in 1883. Those who sought inspiration there included John Singer Sargent, Willard Metcalf, and Theodore Robinson. Um, and these artists really transmitted Monet's ideas to his compatriots back in the United States. By the early 1890s, Impressionism was firmly established as a valid painting style for American artists. Even J. Alden Weir, who wrote that withering letter to his parents, was a convert. This is his Willimantic Connecticut from 1903. 
Most of the repatriated American Impressionists lived in the Northeast, tapping into the cultural energy that was increasingly concentrated in New York. Some of these artists taught in the new art schools that were a consequence of the growing professionalism of the field. Others conducted summer classes dedicated to Impressionism, as Chase did on the east end of Long Island from 1891 to 1902, and as John Henry Twachtman did in Coscob, Connecticut during the 1890s. Uh, so some of the works created during these, um, at these summer art classes, this is William Merritt Chase's Shinnecock, Long Island from 1896 on the left and Twachtman's Old Holly House, Coscob from 1901 on the right. Uh, Impressionists in both Europe and the United States witnessed the transformation from an agrarian to an industrialized urban society um, and were simultaneously excited by the change and nostalgic for the reassuring and familiar past. So there is a real tension in Impressionist artwork, um, both in Europe and the United States, I would say perhaps more prevalent in the United States, that really plays with this tension of showing these new industrialized urban centers versus these beautiful bucolic landscapes. It's a really interesting transition to see. While some American artists only adopted the surface tenets of Impressionism simply to accommodate collectors evolving tastes, these are people who want to sell their works after all, many of them did share the French Impressionist conviction that modern life should be recorded in a vibrant modern style. Their works, like that of their French counterparts, appears to be infused not only uh, with light and color, but with meanings inherent in the subjects they depicted. Some like Child Hassam were captivated by the energy of urban life and captured the flavor of neighborhoods in New York and Paris. Some artists like the painter Edmund Redfield were especially depicted to painting on plein air, even in adverse conditions. Uh, in high winds, Redfield would strap his canvases to trees and paint in knee deep snow, determined to finish the painting in one session, which he believed was integral to the Impressionist belief of capturing those fleeting effects of light and shadow. Uh, so here we're seeing Child Hossum's Fifth Avenue in New York from 1919 on the left and Redfield Bucks County, Pennsylvania on the right. Uh, so as we were saying, two very different approaches to different tenets of Impressionism, the capturing of modern life in Hossum's work and the need to paint en plein air and capture like very fleeting effects of light and shadow in Redfield's piece. So it's interesting to see that American artists are kind of breaking Impressionism apart and focusing on different aspects of it in their own work. Most American Impressionists did choose to portray the countryside to which urbanites like they and their patrons retreated. Many favored artist colonies like those we've discussed before, um, they were especially favorable to those with architecture and activities that evoked a more tranquil era. Uh, so Child Hossum, the painter who gives us this vibrant urban scene on the left, worked on the Isle of Shoals off the New Hampshire coast. William Merritt Chase was found in Southampton, New York. Robert Reed was in Coast Cobb. Henry Ward Ranger, Guy Wiggins, and William Metcalf were in Old Lyme, Connecticut. Um, and Child Hossum, Twachtman, and Mulhopt were often in Rockport, Massachusetts, and many more. Vignettes of domestic life also interested the American Impressionists. Of course, we remember this from Mary Cassatt, who painted primarily in France, um, but William Paxton, Richard Farley, and John Sharman, among others, also often depicted women and children in tranquil interiors and gardens that ignored or denied the enormous epochal changes taking place beyond their walls. Uh, so in the center, we have Cassatt's Little Girl in Blue Armchair from 1878. On the left is Richard Farley's Blue and Gold from the 1870s and John Sharman's At the End of the Porch from the late 19th century. Uh, in French Impressionism, these intimate scenes were usually the domain of women who were denied access to the cabarets, nightclubs, bars, and theaters that, that were the domain of male artists. Uh, American Impressionism, we see many more of these intimate scenes coming from men. So as Impressionism spreads across the United States, different areas begin to develop their own regional variations of the style. Not surprisingly for anyone who's traced any trends that enter the United States from abroad, the Eastern seaboard was the first place to get this. Um, California Impressionism was the next region, prominent regional variation. So like many trends, Impressionism appears on the East and West Coast before making its way into the middle of the country. I'm sure we all recognize that, uh, that way of going about it. So California Impressionism, seen in two examples here, 
Uh, there's a wide variety, as there is a wide variety of regions in California. We see foothills, mountains, seashores, and deserts of the interior, coastal regions, uh, really reached its peak in popularity in the years before the Great Depression. These artists, like those out east, gathered in art colonies in places like Carmel-by-the-Sea and Laguna Beach, as well as in cities like San Francisco, Los Angeles, and Pasadena. On the left, this is Benjamin Brown's Poppies Antelope Valley, sometime before 1942. And on the right is William Keith's Carmel by the Sea from 1905. Uh, so while Impressionist influence painting remained popular in California well after it did in Europe or the, even the Eastern United States, as the depression worsened in the 1930s, newer, more modern styles became accepted and the movement fell into decline. Finally, moving into our neck of the woods, Many Midwestern artists, including Grant Wood and Marvin Cohn, worked in the Impressionist style uh, into the 1920s and 30s. Like the French Impressionists before them, Wood and Cohn concentrated on intimate scenes and small vignettes, as opposed to the wide bird's eye view landscapes that they would become best known for in the 30s and 40s. Uh, here we see several examples from Marvin Cohn. <laughs> this is corner wine shop in the middle down here, sunlighted statue above, the Ville d'Avre over here, uh, and in the summer air, one of my personal favorites on the right side. And these are all from the mid to late 1920s. Grant Wood, of course, has a fantastic collection of them as well. As I said, we are particularly rich in Grant Wood's impressionist pieces. Uh, so this is the Porte de Clocher from Saint Emilion, one of our many Indian Creek scenes, which I'll come back to in a moment. Van Antwerp Place, another gem, and Fountain of the Medici. Again, these are all from varying dates in the 1920s. Um, and you can tell he's depicting both European scenes and American scenes in the same style. Uh, so Wood especially embraced the Impressionist practice of painting the same locales time and time again at different times of day and different times of year under different weather conditions, just like the French Impressionists did. Uh, at the CRMA, we are particularly rich in his depictions of Indian Creek, of course, Cedar Rapids landmark. So he does these throughout the 1920s, and we have summer scenes and fall scenes and midday and end of day. Um, we have just shy of 10 paintings of Indian Creek. Um, that we have shared with the public at several times, even since I have been at the, at the museum, but it's a really wonderful collection to have up at the same time so that you can really compare and contrast what he does. Um, but he's definitely taking this, depicting the same scene over and over again, directly from the tenets of Impressionism. But by 1910, the style was already becoming passe, certainly in Europe and even in America. Uh, the less genteel approach of urban realists known as the Ashcan School was coming to the fore on the East Coast. John Sloan's Six O'Clock Winter from 1912, George Luke's Hester Street from 1905, and Everett Shin's Fifth Avenue from 1910. And of course, in 1913, the immense display of avant-garde European art at the Armory Show made even the Ashcan School seem very old-fashioned. Um, on the bottom was his Kandinsky's Improvisation 27, Marcel Duchamp's New Descending a Staircase, number two on the left, uh, and an old photograph of the Armory Show from 1913 on the above right. Uh, so nevertheless, even though the Armory Show was a huge benchmark in our history, people had very violent reactions to it, both for and against. American Impressionists focus on familiar subjects and rapid technique was still went strong for a couple of decades and left a really indelible mark on American painting. Their works bear witness to their creators' experiences abroad and at home and offer tantalizing reflections of a dynamic period as well as an enchanting record of color and light. One of my favorite pieces of Grant Wood Impressionism is his Barred Door from 1926. So although Grant Wood does not remain an Impressionist, of course, uh, most of us are familiar with the fact in 1928, he went to uh, Munich, Germany to work with the Emil Fry Stained Glass Company to work on the Vets Memorial window. Um, and there he was greatly inspired by the artists of the Northern Renaissance. And he had been tightening his style for specific commissions um, for several years. If you look at any portraits that he commissions during the 1920s, can flash back to a couple of them up here. 
Um, his portraiture is always much, much tighter than anything else that he does. Um, so he always had the ability, and I think it was just being in Europe and seeing the Northern Renaissance pieces in the late 1920s that really solidified for him that that was the style that he wanted to move on to. He wanted to perhaps leave Impressionism behind him. But he never totally does. If we look at some of his mature pieces, this is Autumn Oaks from 1932. He never fully abandons Impressionism. There are always these beautiful moments in his mature pieces where he's very brushy and he's working very quickly. And you can see how much attention he is paying to light and shadow. And he has these beautiful moments of pure color. Um, so this is the entirety of Autumn Oaks on the left. And then one of my favorite little snippets of it on the right. And you can see this beautiful, pure, bright green up here. Um, the short static brushwork that he's done very quickly. Um, so he's still using some of these tenets of Impressionism, even into his very mature period, including Spring in the Country, which is the penultimate painting that he created before he died. Um, this is currently, both this and Autumn Oaks are currently on view in the museum. And so I encourage you to come in and see them because there are these wonderful passages um, of thick paint and really beautiful light brushwork um, where you can see that he is, he has not ever fully abandoned his impressionist stuff, even though the fuller outlines are much smoother and more stylized and definitely looking back to uh, Northern Renaissance precedents, but he always integrates these really wonderful passages of impressionist style, which I think is really fantastic. So I will leave us with these two beautiful snippets of pieces from his mature works to ruminate on. Um, and one of the things I always say is so important about Marvin Cohn and Grant Wood is um, that they did a traditional path to artwork in that they, they went to Europe multiple times, they studied at European academies, um, but they really cemented that the Midwest and the Midwestern landscape was an appropriate subject for artistic depiction, that you didn't need to go to Europe and you didn't need to be on the East Coast. Um, and they both worked at really creating this sense of the Midwest as an artistic center. And so I think it's really cool that they kind of took that tenet of impressionism of you need to depict where you are and what your surroundings are in these intimate, wonderful moments um, and really created regionalism out of that belief. So thank you so much for joining me. I would be happy to answer any questions if anyone has them. All right. Well, if nobody has any questions, thank you so much for joining us on Sunday. And I've enjoyed seeing everyone. Thanks, guys.